Well, this week and next, we're actually going to conclude this series I've been doing, Addressing Men. And we started right at the first of the year. So essentially, all of this year so far has been about uh, encouraging men to be spiritual leaders in their homes, in the church, and in the community. And although I focused on men, really, ladies, now the primary benefactors of this teaching are ladies. Is that not correct? That is, that... uh, As men really step up to be the person God calls them to be, inevitably there's going to be a blessing that spills over to the people around them, primarily the ladies. Now last week we were talking though about this problem of dealing with regrets. All of us have made mistakes, all of us have sinned, all of us have things in our past that we would consider shameful or we carry some guilt about or we have carried guilt, hopefully it's gone and that it's been taken away. But the fact is, we have this problem, and the question then is, what do we do with regrets? And so last week, we focused on this scripture in 2 Corinthians that says that godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. And we said the difference is essentially this. That is, worldly sorrow is being sorry that I was found out or that my sin was revealed. It's not really being sorry about the sin itself or the nature of the sin. It's being sorry that I was caught. But godly sorrow is a place where you recognize the darkness of your own choice, the negative ramifications it had for other people, and the harm that you've brought. And you see there's a a brokenness about that, a, a contriteness in your heart. And that's what it means to have godly sorrow because that leads to repentance. And the word repentance means to turn away, to to essentially ask God to forgive you for some sin and then to continue in that sin says really that you do not have godly sorrow. You're not really repenting. But brokenness comes to a place where you say, I am submitting to, I'm humbling myself before the Lord and I am turning away from my past. And you see... When you come to that place and you receive the fullness of God's forgiveness, the scripture says clearly that it leaves no regret. And I said last week that if you walk in humbleness and in holiness before God, you will have no regret. See, any time that pride in you or rebellion in you causes you to go in a direction that's not of the Lord, inevitably there can be regret associated with that. But when you are obedient to his will, there is no regret. We also talked last week about this scripture in 1 John that says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. And not only that, he will purify us. That is... Confession is a critical thing. The scripture even says, confess your sins one to another and pray in order that you might be healed. That that part of your healing, whether physical, spiritual, or in some other way, can come through this process of confessing my sin. But you see, if we confess, if we come to that place of brokenness and repentance, he is the faithful one. And what I emphasized a lot last week is that, that you still carry guilt and shame about mistakes of your past. And it burdens you and it weighs you down and it makes you feel as if you are a second class Christian in the kingdom of God. Then you have not fully understood and embraced the forgiveness of God. That there's no greater act than Christ shedding his blood. Just as we sing here that that by his blood we are healed. There's no greater act than him giving his life in order that you and I might be cleansed made whole, made pure, so that we can have relationship with God and have eternal life. This is the essence of this, of this journey of human life, is coming to know him and recognizing he is the one that has done everything for you. Now, in continuing along there, I want to talk about what is in the heart of a man, essentially in the heart of men and women, that causes us to go down these paths that lead to regret. Because I do think it's essential that all of us understand our hearts in order that we avoid future regrets. 
And so we start here in this scripture that's in Jeremiah. And it says that the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is beyond cure. Now, first we need to talk about, well, what is the heart? We're not talking here about the physical heart per se. I mean, it's doing its job. It's not deceitful. But we're talking about the innermost part of a man or woman in our soul. It's sort of the mixture and inner working of the mind and the will. It's where you make choices, make decisions. It's the core of who you are. And so that's what we refer to as the heart. And the scripture often talks about the heart in some way or another. And in this particular case, it says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Which is a very interesting scripture if you really dwell upon it. That your own heart, your own mind, your own will can deceive you. And this is very true whenever you go down any pathway that is sinful. That there's something about it that is enticing. You see it as attractive. You go down that pathway. You think there's something good about it. You indulge in it. And then later you regret it. And in, it's clear that you had to have been deceived in order to do something that later you regret. And that deception was not just something that happened outside of you. There is a deceiver. There is spiritual evil that attempts to deceive. But, but in order for it to have an effect, it must take work or take root in your mind, in your heart. And so essentially... You deceive yourself. I've tried to explain this to my boys here in the teenage years, but, but really, do you recognize that your number one enemy is you? It's, it's these desires of the flesh, of this human nature, to rebel against God, to set myself above God, to indulge my own pleasures, to be my own God in essence. And so one thing I must do is conquer my own flesh and my own will because I can deceive myself. It says, however, that the Lord searches the heart and examines the mind. He knows our conduct and will reward us accordingly. And in fact, I, I am certain that God knows my heart and your heart better than we know our own hearts. And the way I know that is that I've been going through the journey of life and I've become aware of something in my heart, in my attitude, of which I was not previously aware. But God, the Spirit, I believe, brought it to light in order that I might defeat it. For example, I, I told you this many years ago that I, that I realized I was a very judgmental person. Well, God knew that and he was pinpointing it and, and wanting to change my attitude about things. But I wasn't aware of it. So in that case, my heart was deceitful. I was unaware of it. And God knew my heart better than me. In fact, if you pray that the Lord would reveal to you things about your heart that are not of him, I'm sure over time you will see that reality. The scripture also says this. It says, all a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. Now, is it not true that you and I can rationalize and justify anything? That is, we can make a lot of unwise choices, maybe some very wicked choices, and we can come up with a long pattern of excuses and reasons as to why it's not really my fault. You know, for example, if I was walking across the stage here and I stumbled and nearly fell, surely what would I do? I would look back to see what minor problem created that disaster. In other words, in my heart, I would look for something to blame, would I not? Now, some of you are hoping, well, I hope he doesn't demonstrate that here immediately. Right? But now... There is something about us that we don't want to take responsibility. We want to blame something. We want to excuse away our own behavior. And we can justify anything in our own minds. 
And you see, you must be aware of the deceptive nature of your own heart. Because you, you might justify doing things that are not sinful, but they are not loving either. Spending too much time away from your spouse or away from your children and things like that. And maybe not doing anything sinful, but deceived into thinking these other things are more important than the primary duty that is before you in loving those people. And see, we must be concerned or careful that we don't deceive ourselves about what are the critical things in life. In Romans it says, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. This was Paul writing. This is the part where he goes on to say, I do what I don't want to do even though I don't want to do it. But he does it anyway. And so do we. Now, when you first read that statement, I know that nothing good lives in me, what thought comes to your mind? Do you say, well, you know, I don't think that's quite right. In fact, now, before I became a Christian, if you had asked me about the nature of humans, I would have said that humans are basically good. And that because of systematic things in the world, whatever it might be, poverty or some other issue, that, that people make bad choices. Well, then I came to a place of recognizing that at least there was one person who was not basically good, and that was me. And that's when I came to repent and accept Christ, because I didn't like what was in my heart. And then as I came to understand the truth about Scripture and then came to understand people better, I realized that, hey, we're all pretty wicked, that there's something dark in all of our hearts. Now, I might have hung on for a while to the idea that there was something still good in there. But I've come to the place of clearly believing that Scripture is an absolute eternal truth. That there is nothing good that lives in me, that is in my flesh apart from the Spirit of God. That in my flesh, apart from the Spirit of God, I will serve only myself Anything that is good that arises in and through me is his work. And you see, you must come to a place of recognizing this truth. That there is nothing good in me apart from him. Now the question is, well, why? And... In this case, Psalm 51 is the psalm that David wrote. We looked at part of it last week after he had sinned with Bathsheba. And, and in this particular part, he says that, I, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. Now, the latter half of that scripture in older days was often misapplied. Maybe some of you encountered a teaching like this, but, but some people would take the latter half of that scripture that talks about being sinful from the time my mother conceived me and would talk about sex somehow in, inherently being sinful. I, I, I know that sort of that was a case a few decades ago. Now, that is not what that scripture is talking about. In fact, God created sex. Sex is something that is blessed in the confines of marriage. It's his plan, his purpose. And he even says, be fruitful and multiply. Children are a blessing from the Lord. But there was teaching years ago that would be along that line and misapplied. But in this case, that David is not in any way referring to that. What he's talking about is his own nature, and he recognizes that he has been wicked since literally the time he was born. And what he's understanding there is what we would call, we would call original sin. That is, the sin nature that has been passed down to all humans all the way back to, to Adam and Eve. The fact is you are born physically alive with that beautiful, cute little body, and those little tiny toes, you know how they're so sweet. And you're born with, with a soul, that is, God has imprinted in you a personality, a mind, and so forth, but you are born spiritually dead. That is, where there should be life in your innermost being, in the spirit there is emptiness. Now, this is the place that God has carved out for his spirit to dwell. That's why we're referred to as the temple of the Holy Spirit. But at the place of physical birth, his spirit is not in you. 
you have to come to the place of inviting him in. This is his work. The Spirit woos you to the place of surrendering and inviting him into your life. But so the fact is you are born spiritually dead even though you are alive. And then Paul later, for example, he talks about being made alive in Christ. You are made alive when you repent. His Spirit comes to dwell within you. But in and of yourself, apart from the Holy Spirit, you are sinful literally from birth. Now, when parents tend to have their first child, they don't believe that. When they have their second child by then, they know it is true. Is that not the case? You have the first child, you think, oh, this sweet little perfect thing. And then like suddenly, I don't know, maybe 18 months, two years, something happens and you're shocked. You're like, really? Who changed or swapped out my person? But then you have the second child and you're like, well, yeah, we're used to that. After you've had three or more, it's like, ah. You just know what it is. It's this problem. It's the reality of human life. And see, in Proverbs it says, Who can say that I kept my heart pure and am clean and without sin? None of us can. And see, this is the lie of religion and legalism. I know many of you have had a religious, legalistic background where people pretended to abide by the rules and pretended to be the holy people. And the fact is, every person fails. But we put up this artificial game of if you abide by the rules... You see, religion is man's attempt to control God and to control other people. The scripture says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. To love God, love people. And religion is the attempt to do the opposite. It is an attempt to control God and to control other people. And see, this relationship with Christ is, has nothing to do with religion. It is about knowing him and walking with him. And part of knowing him is recognizing my desperate need for him. Similarly, in Ecclesiastes, it says there is not a righteous man on earth, not one. In Romans, it says there is no one who does good, not even one, not even your sweet Grandma Bessie. You know, the the wonderful lady that you thought was so perfect. If you knew everything about her life, you'd know, oh, she's just like us. In fact, there are probably some things about sweet Grandma that happened in her younger years that she would never tell you. But you see, we are born with this problem. And there's really only one way out. That's Christ. Now the core of that problem is that man is prideful. Now back to that part about the heart is deceitful. The reason the heart is deceitful at its core is pride. That somehow or another that I am more wise than God, more seen, more understanding. And if you would sift through the thoughts that you have and the choices that you make, very, very often the core of the problem is pride. Now, I'm sure very few of you have ever done this, but let us say that you had a favorite team, a college football team that you just really adored and you wore their colors everywhere and you got little flags sticking up on your car and bumper stickers and everything, right? You might even have a tattoo somewhere. And I just say that you're watching your favorite team in the conference championship game and they are playing the worst game they've played all season. And you began to throw things at the TV and you begin to cuss at the announcers. And people in the rest of your household scatter because they know there's danger in the television room. I, I know none of you have never done that. But let us assume that you have. What is the reason? I mean, really, what is the core reason? Well, I would say it's like this, that you have so identified yourself with that team that essentially 
they are embarrassing you, whether you realize it or not. And when they win, what it does is it builds up your pride. You're able to wear your bright colored jacket, whatever color it might be, with a, a sense of really refined pride. But if they just lost the big game and you're going out the door, you pick a different jacket. You know what I mean? Do you see, at the core of that issue is you have identified with it and it affects your pride. I mean, why when, who was it, the Seahawks and won the, in, uh, the Super Bowl? I'm sure that sales of Seahawks merchandise skyrocketed because what? It helped people's pride. And see, if you really identify a lot of things right at the heart of the reason you are angry or upset or you've made a bad choice is because of your pride. And that's why pride is such a wicked thing. See, the worst part of pride says there is no God. That's the fool. Now, I thought about this. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, I gave you a definition, if you were here, about what it is to be a real man, an authentic man. And I was thinking here about the problem of the heart of every man, and I thought, well, what does it mean to be an unreal or unauthentic or fake man? You could use the word phony. And I set about writing the definition of what that would be. And so I said that an unauthentic man is filled with pride, based on that scripture that we just looked at. He is the one who thinks there is no God who sees what he does. He is driven by his personal pleasure. He speaks without self-control, doesn't worry about how his words wound others. And he models foolishness. That is, his life is reckless and uncontrolled, and everybody around him can see it, but he doesn't recognize it. He's an artificial man, and he imagines that he is self-sufficient and pretends that he needs no one. Do you realize how foolish that is to think that I can handle life all by myself? You see, literally, I believe that human beings act as if they created themselves and they control their eternal destiny. I mean, really, we act as if we created ourselves. When, in fact, you and I, we didn't even exist, any of us here, a hundred years ago. And we act as if we created ourselves, we're self-sufficient, we're independent, when, in fact, that is a game. We are pretending we're in control. A man of this nature, he loves himself more than he loves others. He bitterly holds on to grudges because he doesn't know how to forgive. He's a source of heartache to many people. Probably a lot of you are beginning to shape in your mind the identity of a person that you know that fits right in that category who is a heartache to you and to many others. In his immaturity, he avoids and rejects responsibility. He expects others to provide for him. And he disregards the needs of others, even his own family. He selfishly takes advantage of persons uh, for his own gratification and gain. It's about himself, not about anybody else. He blames others for his mistakes, and he denies his need to change. It's like the alcoholic who everybody else knows they're an alcoholic who denies he's an alcoholic. He doesn't need to change. He's easily angered, gets mad a lot, impatient, imprudent, meaning he, he's reckless with his finances or reckless in other ways. He's aimless. Doesn't know where he's going in life. He's just being today. He rejects wise counsel and spurns wisdom. When somebody comes alongside of him and tries to help him, he rejects them, usually angrily. I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone. He continuously rebels against authority and the, and the will of God himself. Essentially, 
he is his own God. Or he is attempting to be. Now, as I sat down to write that, I found that it wasn't that hard. Because I've been that man. And I think if we're all honest, gentlemen, we all have been. Have we not? Maybe not all of those characteristics simultaneously at one time, but, but all of those characteristics, at least most all of them, sometime. And if you were to contrast that definition that I gave you some time ago about an authentic man, really all of those things in that definition are impossible in our own flesh. This is who we are without Christ. Is that not true? And you see, in order to be a genuine man, an authentic man, a real man, it requires this humility, this brokenness, this contriteness in which your heart is so aware of your own deceitfulness and darkness that you know apart from him there is nothing good that will come in your life. Or you might do a few good things to mask over these, but at the core, that's what's there. That's why um, David said in Psalm 51, this we looked at briefly uh, last week or two weeks ago, and you know, after he'd sinned with Bathsheba and he had been confronted by the prophet Nathan, he came to a place of brokenness and he cried out to God and said, Create in me a pure heart. Change me from the inside out. He said to the Lord, you don't delight in sacrifice or I would bring it or you don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. But he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That God does not despise. And see, the scripture even refers to David as a man after God's own heart. Despite the fact that he did some pretty terrible things. Adultery, essentially murder. And the fact is, no person can be identified as a holy man or somebody after God's own heart by their own flesh or their own works. It's by this brokenness that a person is transformed. It's a bit sad, but I, I've over the years met people that it's clear they really loved God. And inevitably I've thought, I wonder what happened to bring them to a place of brokenness. Because you don't just get there by sort of frolicking through life or, or just dancing through life. You get to that place by recognizing the need that the Lord would create in us a pure heart. And see, gentlemen, in talking about you being a leader, being the person that God calls you to be, it starts with this humbleness of recognizing how desperate we are it's not about you doing better or achieving more or working harder. It's about you being humble before the Lord in desperation that he would do more in you. That he would make you more loving, more kind, more gentle, more peaceful, more patient, more self-controlled. And the net effect of that is that blessings come upon the people around you. When the fruit of his spirit works through you. So my prayer is this, that you would recognize that it's all his work. Anything good, it comes from him. That you would step up to be the man that God calls you to be, but not in your own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you and empowers you to be what you cannot be on your own. That you might truly be a leader in your home. 
Now, to finish this teaching, I want to invite the Jacksons, if they would come up here. Nathan, who was leading worship here, and his family. And the reason I'm inviting them up is um, to have them share about some really interesting things that they did earlier this year. If you were here, right at, if you'll leave that up for a second, please. If you were here right at the start of the year, we talked about that there were four major things we wanted to do this year in terms of focus as a church. I called them 4M14, and they were focusing upon men, marriage, millennials, young folks, and missions. Now, what they did wasn't because of our plan, but it so happens that they in, really involved three of these things in a special little journey. That in terms of being a man, in terms of being a leader in their home, and I'm certainly, this had an impact upon their marriage in a positive way, but it also involved missions. And so if you would, and this is Nathan and Jamie and their kids, I'll let you introduce the kids. Well, we have Esther, she's six, and Titus, he's 11, and Rocky, he's 10. And so you want to tell us about the journey you took around Christmas time? This uh, past Christmas, we went to Haiti, and we went the 21st through the 28th. So we were very determined to be there on Christmas. Um, 2012, I don't know if it was during Christmas or right around that time, Jamie and I just thought, next year we need to do something that's not commercial uh, something that's not gifts focused on. Um, I think a lot of times at Christmas we get confused with what we need, with what we want, and um, it was just. It's even better for people around us. We said we're do, we're not doing presents, and we're going to Haiti, and then they don't have to worry about buying us another weird scarf that we didn't know if we liked or a tie or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever. I mean, Christmas is cool. I'm not uh, knocking all that too much, but we felt that like that was something that we needed to do. Uh, so we started looking at Haiti, and it was a a close place for us to still take the kids to another country but not have to fly for a day and a half or something to get there. Now, if you're not aware, Haiti is one of the most impoverished nations in the entire world, certainly in the Western Hemisphere. I think it's the most impoverished nation. And not only that, a very spiritually oppressed nation. I was talking with a person who's a leader in Compassion International, and they take mission trips around the world. He said the, the place where they warn people the most about spiritual oppression is going to, is going to Haiti. That it, They encounter it more there than anyplace else. So you decided to take your whole family... Not just the two adults, but all kids went with you. So you want to tell us a little bit about the journey? Well, we decided that we were going to hook up with a children's ministry that my mom had kind of gotten me connected with just through conversations about where we wanted to go. And it's, um, it was actually on the screen a few slides ago. It's called Faith, Hope, Love, Infant Rescue. And if you guys don't know me, um, my background is special education, and I lead the special needs ministry here at the church, and my heart is for special needs kids. And so this was perfect because this lady had, takes in special needs kids in Haiti, and like what Robert was saying is true. You know, this is a very impoverished nation where there's just not a lot of money to even live. And so if you have a child that has a special need, maybe they have club feet or they have a mental disability or a physical disability, there is no money to take care of them. And there's no money to get them surgeries. There's no such thing as health insurance or anything like that. So, you know, parents can love their kids and still not be able to take care of them. And so they will take care of them as long as they can. And then it just gets to the point where they are, their kid is going to die or they're going to do something desperate. And so a lot of times these special needs children are abandoned at the hospital. And so when that happens, they contact this little ministry and they will come and evaluate the situation and take the kids in. So a lot of the pictures that you saw, the kids, most of them have some sort of special need. And many of them have loving families. And what's cool is they will actually track down the family and, and say, listen, don't be ashamed of what you had to do because you're in a desperate situation. Let us take care of your child. Come visit anytime you want to. And when they're healthy and well, we'll put them back in your home. And so it's a really neat connection that we had there. So that was the first place that we went to. And then we got connected through 
Karen and Michael Broyles, who actually used to go to church here in their ministries, I mean, their missionaries that our church supports, they lived there and we stayed with them. And they were kind of our ground touch point person and they kind of helped us get connected different places. And um, they gave me the name of a place that is, has a girl's home called Haiti Under God, and they call it Hug for short. And um, they wanted dance lessons. And also, many of you guys may know that I used to dance to be a teacher in the dance ministry here, so that was perfect for me too. So I kind of got some dance stuff coordinated um, with them and had a class. But what's cool is they have enough sponsors and donations. They didn't really need any monetary support. So we had brought some supplies and we had some cash to use for, you know, ministry. Uh, missions down there, but they didn't need that, which was pretty neat. They were pretty honest about that. Um, so we just taught them things, and then I'll let Nathan share in a minute. He did some building for them. Um, and then the last place was a connection through Hug, because they said, listen, we don't need the money right now. We've got good sponsors, but there's another children's home, True Orphanage. These kids don't have parents. They're just scraping along, and they have nothing. And I'll let Nathan share about that, because when we got there, they, they really did have nothing. Let me point out that a lot of these pictures you see in aircraft, uh, there, Michael Broyles is with Mission Aviation Fellowship, and he is sponsored by this church, he and his wife Karen, and so that's who you connected with. And when you were talking, a lot of those were running through. But anyway, Nathan. Well, and to back up just a little bit, Jamie and I, we're, we're pretty good at procrastination, so we, we share that good trait. So we, we decided in 2012 that we were going to go, and then we talked all through it, and then about August... Um, one night we'd been talking about it. The next morning I just called Jamie from work and I said, just buy our tickets so we're committed. Like, we're going to Haiti and no excuses. So we we did that and um, tested our faith a little bit because we, as soon as we did that, it seemed like all of our communication with people in Haiti went dead for at least about a month and we're just thinking, wow, this is going to be interesting. We're going to be getting off the plane and saying, anybody need some help? You know, <laughs> like we didn't really know what we were going to be doing. But through a series of events, God put together a lot of things for us to do. That was, it was just amazing. We had people coming to the door just bringing money over. We had kids bringing their allowance over. We had just tons of people bringing money and supplies. And, and uh, it, was, it was quite a neat experience. Um, Rocky's class um, at um, John Adams Elementary, his teacher got wind of it and decided they wanted to use this as their uh, community service project, she said. So um, it was really neat. I mean, we sponsored, what, 22? 22 to 25, somewhere in there. Um, individual kids, and they all got a big you know, gift basket of backpacks and shoes and clothes and school supplies and we ended up taking all that with us on the plane with a series of bunch of boxes. And uh, the place that stuck out to me the most was when we went to a place called Lifesaver that Jamie referred to. They actually did not even know that we were coming. We had been given, I think, $2,200 through a series of a bunch of people. And um, the day after Christmas, I just told Michael Broyles, I said, let's go try to find this place. He didn't know where it was either. They didn't know we were coming. All we knew is what it was called and a guy's phone number. So we're driving all over Haiti looking for it. We go to a couple addresses. It's not there. And um, we finally got a hold of him, and we showed up, and they just told us that they'd been praying for help, and it was just it was a super neat situation. And uh, we were able to tell them that God had to set this up because they didn't know us. We didn't know them. And we were there. We were able to get them a generator and a freezer and a bunch of food at the market. So it was that was the most touching part to me. Is there any particular part you'd like to share from the kids? <laughs> okay. Um, so um, when we went to Faith, Hope, Love, the infant rescue, the first place. Um, the first time we really spent a day there was when it was when my mom she taught a dance class there and she taught everybody a dance and there was just this little boy named Billy and he was sitting he was just sitting in a chair and everybody else was dancing and he um I was just like 
does he want to dance? And they said that he just, he can't really dance. So I went up and I, um, I helped him up and I, um, I helped him and he danced a little bit and I just found out that he had club feet and he couldn't, he, he also had tumors or something in his eyes that made them swell up. So he has to like look like this to see. Like he can't really see, he has to squint. And he was just, he was my best friend during the whole trip. How, how do you think this journey impacted your family? Well, I think it was, as, now as parents out there, you know, to watch your kids, their heart be full of Jesus, there is nothing better in the world. And to see, you know, Rocky, he was um, really instrumental right there, those desks. Those are, they're not painted yet at, in this picture, but those desks were made for the Haiti Under God girls. Um, and Rocky and Nathan and a few other Haitians worked like extremely hard to get those desks made and there were three double-sided desks and those of you that are in my age category are going to remember the little privacy screens, the little desks that you can work at for, for privacy. But um, those Haiti Under God girls were rescued from the most dangerous area in Haiti called City Soleil. Um, those girls were going to be marketed like their future was very bleak. And so they were rescued out of that and given the opportunity to get an education. So just getting those desks so that they could study was a huge part of their education. And, you know, Nathan came back and he said, man, Rocky really sticks at things. Like he doesn't give up. And we couldn't have made those desks as fast. We couldn't have got them done in one day, which is what they needed to do without him. And so just to watch that unfold and then Titus and Esther at the infant rescue, um, Esther's pretty clingy to me. You know, she's young and she's kind of like my little shadow. And at one point she had been gone from me for like 45 minutes. And I remember kind of frantically looking around, you know, where, where is Esther? I'm so used to her being glued to my side. And she was just out playing with a little, there's a little two-year-old girl named Lovna that she got really connected with. And so the, the freedom of the spirit of the Lord was just working in them. And it really blessed me, but Titus never put Billy down. And he really took, took him under his wing and to really watch that blessed me. And I think we may go back. You know, Billy's got a, he's got a lot of difficulties in, in his future. He needs that club foot surgery. And he also has been treated for a lymphatic disease. And there's just some things that are going to go on in his little four or five-year-old life that are going to be tough. They don't even know how old he is. They don't know when his birthday is. He was just abandoned on a construction site. And um, I just loved watching the love of God pour through my son because Billy was probably the most difficult child to look at. And it didn't matter. I'm proud of him. Last night you mentioned that you actually had some fears or concerns about taking your kids out of the country, but you trusted God and did so anyway. And I'm sure that the Lord is, did some good things in the lives of those people. But, you know, whenever you go and serve somebody else, inevitably he does something in your own heart. And I would think for your kids, as long as they live, they will remember that in a critical way. So I just wanted you to share in their journey, and particularly as we're talking about men being the leaders in their home, well, this is a unique way to help your kids grow an understanding of serving others around the world. And so uh, some of the family members are going to close the service for us. <laughs> 